From the campus of Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan, this is Calvin Forum, a discussion of religious and ethical issues promoting faith-shaped thinking. And welcome once again to the Calvin Forum. My name is Bob Meiring. I'm an employee here at Calvin College with the Calvin Accelerated Program. I'm also a minister in the Christian Reformed Church and upon occasion host this program. Thank you for watching. We have a very special guest today, someone visiting Grand Rapids who agreed to uh, visit with us and to meet on Calvin Forum, and that is Frank Schaefer. Welcome, Frank. Nice Frank is an author. He is a movie director. And perhaps uh, the name will also suggest your father, who was Francis Schaefer, um, noted apologist for evangelical Christianity. Yeah, I think that'd be a fair title. Right. But today we're going to begin with a good story one that has intrigued me as I've learned more about it from the books you have written and so forth. Let's mention the books. The latest one was Dancing Alone, published by... Holy Cross Press. Holy Cross Press, and prior to that was a novel, Portofino. That's right. By Macmillan Press. Yep, published by Macmillan. And those have been in the last couple of years. The story we want to hear about is Frank's journey from growing up as an evangelical Christian under a father who was a Presbyterian minister. That's right, yeah. And uh, uh, did he found Labrie? Was that a, yes? He began that work. He in and my mother Edith Schaefer began that work together back in uh, 1954. Sure. So, and someone growing up that way today is an is a Christian in the Orthodox tradition, the Eastern Orthodox Church, and we want to find out how all of that happened. I might simply be able to say, "Tell us about it," and that'll take care of the show. I don't know, but well, probably where does will. it all begin? <laughs> it's a long story. Yes. Well, you know, as you mentioned, I grew up in Labrie in Switzerland. Uh, with my father Francis Schaefer, my mother Edith. My whole childhood memory is one of being in a Christian community that took its faith very seriously. So obviously my own journey from that evangelical Protestant background into the Eastern Orthodox Church, I joined the Greek Orthodox Church in 1990, was not a lightly undertaken matter. Um, I come from a family that took ideas seriously and uh, the idea of Christian truth in particular very seriously. So my journey kind of began, I suppose, uh, accidentally, if you want to use that term. Um, I guess or we as Christians don't. Yes. Yeah, we, we, we as Christians <laughs> don't believe in accidents. But um, uh, there are some folks who, who for, from a Protestant point of view, might not think it's providential. So I didn't want to use that word either. They might not like it. Sure. Um, but I, I really was not looking for the Orthodox tradition. What I was looking for was the historical church. Uh, because I became increasingly dissatisfied over the years with, I guess, two things. One was my own spiritual progress, or lack thereof, uh, in a journey toward Christ, I suppose you could put it. And the other was really the state of the Protestant culture here in North America that our uh, evangelical uh, consensus had built, uh, which I felt was, um, uh, had a lot of liabilities. For instance, the, the pluralism that evangelicals and Protestants have introduced with their 23,000 denominations and uh, even more interpretations of the Bible, I feel led very quickly to the secular pluralism we have around us, where everybody agrees that there are many ways to truth and, uh, and, and, as it were, no such thing as truth in an absolute sense. So I kind of had a philosophical intellectual series of questions about our own Protestant history, and I had some personal questions about my own spiritual life. And so I'd started doing something about 12 or 15 years ago that I really had not uh, concentrated on much before, and that is I began to read both church history and what are known as the church fathers, uh, the patristic fathers, the anti-Nicene fathers, people like Irenaeus of Lyon, uh, Polycarp, Ignatius of Antioch, and others. These would be major Christian thinkers and writers in the first four, first, five... First and second and third centuries right. to start with, and then after that. Actually, right here in this town, uh, Erdmans, uh, publishes the definitive English translation of the Anti-Nicene right. and the Patristic Fathers in a wonderful set that I think is available for around $250 or something like that. Um, so, so they shouldn't be hard to get in this area. But um, I began to read these, and I also started reading some of the ancient histories of the church, for instance, by Eusebius that was written in uh, the 4th century. Uh, he was the first real church historian, in an attempt to try to find if, if somewhere along the line uh, we Christians had gone a little bit off the rails. And to my amazement, what I discovered was that 
uh, while there are many different points of view on doctrine, and after all, having grown up Protestant doctrine and theology is always what we talk about, but church history is actually fairly straightforward and well documented. For instance, just to take one area, um, there are many different doctrines of the sacraments of communion or baptism. But when you read church history, uh, it becomes evident very quickly that the historical church uh, did not have many points of view on these things and that when you look at their practices, whether it's from the archaeological records of places like Ravenna in Italy where you have a third and fourth century baptistry and you know mm -hmm. what they did there, or whether you read the histories of the church like Eusebius's fourth century history of the church, you very soon discover that what the church has always been uh, is not a matter of just subjective opinion. Well, uh, I read this verse that way, or the Lord is speaking to my heart this way, or, you know, my pastor says. It's actually rather objective empirical evidence. And I guess I discovered three things, uh, basically, somewhere in there. One was that uh, the, to, to be a Christian, it always meant that you believed certain things, uh, which could be counts, uh, summed up, I guess, in the Nicene Creed. Um, the second thing it meant was that you did and did not do certain things. So you could repeat the creed till you were blue in the face, but if, you're, if you were running an abortion clinic and had run out on your wife and, and were committing adultery or if you were, uh, you know, abandoning your family, right. the creed wasn't going right. to, to cut it. To save you. Right? That's right. And then, the, but the third thing was that I discovered that kind of amazed me from my background because I knew so little about it, was that the church had always worshipped in a very definite way. And uh, we Protestants, or at least speaking for myself, kind of get the idea that worship is something you make up as you go along, that you do, you know, if you like banging a tambourine, you bang a tambourine. If you want to do cartwheels, do that. If you're reformed and worship is four white walls and a sermon, do that. And, and uh, spirituality being the feeling you get at the end of the sermon. And no one seems to uh, remember much these days that um, Christian morality, worship, and doctrine were all piece of one piece of fabric. So I guess for me, it boiled down to this. Uh, there came a certain time in reading some church history and talking to people and so forth that I came to realize, I'll put it this way, that if someone from any part of the historical church, let's say a, a third century Christian from Carthage uh, and a 15th century Christian from, from Lyon in France and a 10th century Christian from Byzantium in Constantinople had gone to any one of each other's churches with a thousand years separating them, uh, and, and thousands of miles as well, and cultural and history and differences and everything, each would have known exactly where they were in the other's service instantly. They not only would have known they were in a Christian church, they would have known where they were in the liturgy. In, the, in, in exactly the same way that when we read in the New Testament that Christ went up to the synagogue, the temple, to pray, he didn't have to have ancient... Uh, uh, Jewish worship explained to him. He knew where he was. We we're told he read the passage for the day, which means we know there was a lectionary or, or a liturgy in the sense it wasn't just a free form. It was the passage of the day. Well, similarly, any Christian from anywhere in history until our very recent era could have gone to any other Christian church and known where they were almost instantly within the liturgy. That's how uniform it was. And I think an atheist reading Christian history, whether they believed in Christ or not, would draw the same conclusion. This is just simply the history of the church. Uh, whether Christianity is true or not, of course, is another question. But then I think the reverse is true, and that is you could take any same group of people from the historical church, bring them to almost any Protestant church today, and the, the amazing thing to realize is, is none of them would know where they were. They would not see any of the visible signs where they were. I, I don't know how you are, but I grew up on a little patch of mountainside in Switzerland. And if you are a country boy, I don't know whether you grew up in the I country. I did grow up on the farm, yes. Okay. Well, I'll bet you that if you were dropped blindfold on any corner of that farm and you took the blindfold off, you'd know where you were. Exactly. I mean, I'm over by the big tree right. that has the, and the, the barn limb, that way. and the swing yeah. was used to be on this tree, yeah. and the barn's over right. there. You'd be instantly located. All the visible signs would be the same. Well, if you took somebody from the historic church and dropped them into a Protestant church, they would be saying, well, where is the Eucharistic cup? Uh, where's the priest who heard confession last night before anybody could be properly prepared to take communion? Where's the reading of the day? Where are the psalms the church have prayed since the beginning and before that the Jews prayed in the synagogues? And they would... They would they would not see uh, these things. So I think when, I, when, when that started to dawn on me, uh, then I began to ask another set of questions, and that simply wasn't, well, what's wrong with my own spiritual life or this culture, but more to the point, A, is there such a thing as the historical church, not a historical church, uh, the church, and B, is, is it still something you can locate in the 20th century? Is this something I could be part of? Or now has the 
has everything become so free form and, uh, and, and, and so relativistic that I'll never be able to find out, uh, I'll never be able to find a body of Christians who are still worshiping and believing and holding the doctrine uh, of the ancient church. And so then my, my quest, as it were, changed and I started really looking for that. And, and then eventually, that is what led me into the Eastern Orthodox Church or the Greek Orthodox Church that I became part of. And, and, of and course, I want to explore some of that uh, uh, historical that. development and so forth uh, with you uh, a little later on. But let me come back to a more personal sort of thing now. As you were reading, studying, thinking of this, what was happening in your life? Were you finding people um, uh, skeptical at what you were saying or were you talking to people about this interest of yours and this movement of yours and and how did people react did they help you did they hinder you well uh, let, let me put it this way I think a lot of evangelicals uh, and Protestants are used to themselves taking the mantle of the kind of chosen people and so they're not going to begin questioning what they take as a self-evident given um, and, and so I don't think people were, um, I didn't run into any hostility, but I ran into a lot of people who just couldn't understand what on earth I was uh, why you doing, be asking why I would be interesting with the, interested in this. But, um, but, you know, like so many things in life, when you start a certain train of thought, uh, if you, you know, the, the problem is if you ask honest questions, sometimes you really do find answers. Yes, yes. And then, of course, the challenge is, is, well, what are you going to do about this? And, and for my own thinking, what happened was is that what started out as a kind of a personal matter, uh, a, a, a kind of a historical study as an author and as someone who reads and this sort of thing, um, soon went further than that in the sense that I realized that um, indeed if Protestantism had moved as far away from the historical church as it seemed to have uh, in, in reading church history, particularly the history of the church before the split between the East and the West, uh, be, when the Roman Catholics went off and became Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox became right. Eastern Orthodox in about 1054. Well, before that, that period of history, it seemed to me that um, if a, a sincere Christian came to the conclusion that uh, uh, his form of worship, uh, some of his doctrine, uh, some of the moral teachings now accepted, say, within the wider scope of Protestantism had really gone off the rails in these areas, that for me anyway, it couldn't just remain a historical or abstract study. It became very personal. And I guess the way to sum it up would be uh, on a personal level, well then where does somebody go, where do you go to church? Uh, where do you worship? How do you worship? Um, if other Christians have always worshipped this way, where could I go? So for me, coming from the Western Christian perspective, to me, the historical church always sort of meant Rome. So for a while, with, with friends of mine, uh, like, uh, for instance, Thomas Howard and some others, uh, I started looking very seriously at the Roman now, Catholic Church. Now, Thomas Howard, another author, has gone into the Roman Catholic Church. He became tradition. Roman Catholic right. about 10 years ago. And you were uh, in conversation he, he with He and I yourself. happened to be kind of neighbors in New England. And uh, before that, a friend of my family's, uh, Malcolm Muggeridge, who was a British yes, author, he had yes. become Roman Catholic, and I had known him and corresponded with him, and he had been a friend of my father's and so forth. So I thought, well, maybe I'll go this way. But I interestingly enough, a couple of things kept me out of that. And uh, can I sure. ask to hold off that for a sure. moment? We'll find out what kept you out of it, and then how you finally did make that decision. Yeah. We're talking with Frank Schaefer here on the Calvin Forum, and we're going to take a break right now, and we hope you'll come back in just a moment. Welcome back to Calvin Forum. I'm Bob Myring. We're talking today with Frank Schaefer, an author, movie producer, movie director, about his journey from evangelical Christianity to Eastern Orthodoxy. We got as far as your indicating an interest in uh, Catholicism. Right. Friends like um, Thomas Howard and Malcolm Muggeridge and so, both of whom became, went in, Roman, became Catholic. Roman Catholic. They interested you, you said, and then a, few, a couple of things yeah. kept you back. Why don't yeah, we well, pick it up there? As I was saying, you know, coming from a Western perspective, Obviously, all Protestants are stepchildren of the Roman Catholic right. Church. We define ourselves over against yeah. them. And, and they existed before we did, and we come out of that. So I thought, well, if you're going to retrace your steps back into the historical church, you're going to have to be going into the Roman Catholic mm -hmm. Church. Plus, I, I had done a lot of work and continue to be part of the pro-life movement in this country. And obviously, every time I turn around, I'm working with the Roman Catholic, exactly. and many of them are my very good friends in that area, so it seemed something quite logical. But um, I, I guess two kind of areas uh, stopped me, and, and neither were particularly theological, more historical and personal. Uh, on the historical front, the more of the church fathers and early church histories I read, the less I could find about the Pope, 
uh, let alone about infallibility. And what you find is in church history a collegial system of church government where you had local bishops who agreed on the doctrines of the church and what was called the holy tradition, mm -hmm. which can be defined as all those things believed by all Christians everywhere since the beginning. But uh, they certainly didn't put one's authority over the other, uh, let alone give anybody infallible powers. In fact, in church history, the first time you see the word pope used, it's simply used as a term of affection, papa, uh, for the bishop of Alexandria. And uh, that's in about the third century. And so, you know, that was one area. It really is not there. It's a later political uh, invention of convenience. There was a bishop of Rome. Sure. He had a great deal of honor and authority, but he was just another bishop. Maybe we should mention that uh, for those unfamiliar with church history, church history developed in the first few centuries in terms of uh, various centers of authority. That's right. A Antioch, uh, Alexandria, Alexandria, Constantinople, right. Rome, Jerusalem and a, being the original. There was a bishop located in, in each. each one yeah. who had an area of authority mm -hmm. and then the development of the bishop at Rome is what you're saying caused you some difficulty. Yeah and, and it just simply is out of character with the rest of the church and of course in the end it led to a split between the Roman Catholic Church and everyone else. At that point everyone else being all the Eastern churches. Right. What we call the Eastern churches but of course at that point Constantinople was the center of the civilized world. It yes. wasn't Europe hadn't moved this way yet. Um, you know, what was going on in, in, uh, in, in the collapsing Roman Empire in places like France and so forth, were, they were literally sliding into uh, uh, what we consider to be and talk about as the Dark, the dark Ages age, later. Middle Ages, right. Yeah. Then the other reason, though, had something to do with much more personal, what we were talking about in the first half. Um, and, of course, I have to mention, I talk about all this in my book, Dancing Alone, for anybody more interested mm -hmm. in going into mm -hmm. it. Dancing Alone, subtitle, The Quest for Orthodox Faith in the Age of False Religion, um, goes into all this. Why Dancing Alone? Well, because I think that's the, the perennial Protestant problem. You are dancing alone. You know, confession is a muttered prayer into your pillow at 2 in the morning. Uh, you're by yourself. Sure. Um, salvation is purely in your own heart. It's you and Jesus. You're not plugging into any wider tradition of community and worship. It's, it's all personalized. It's all inward looking. It tends to leave you very individual, uh, very much an individual and outside of a community. Right. It's kind of a parenthesis. But the other, the other reason was just a practical one. You know, one of the things I object to about modern Protestantism and have such trouble with is the chaos and what I would call the trivialization of worship, what I would call the pluralism of approaches to Christianity, this kind of relativistic idea that if it feels good, do it in the area of worship, whatever. Unfortunately, exactly the same thing is true of the modern American Roman Catholic Church. And I didn't want to cause all the upheaval in my life to jump from the frying pan into the fire. And, you know, I, I uh, frankly, um, uh, you know, if I wanted to join a charismatic style worship service, I, I, I would do that. But, you know, I, what I don't need is an ex Mary Knoll nun handing out pink balloons at her liturgy while somebody strums a guitar and sings old Peter, Paul, and Mary songs as the liturgy. When, when you talk like this, do you make Catholics angry? No, actually, oh. <laughs> you know, you would be surprised at something. And that is the conservative Roman Catholics. Yes would actually be glad to hear me saying that because they would say, aha, you see, here's someone who would have perhaps come into the Roman Catholic yes, Church had yes. we not devalued our liturgy right, so much. Right. And they would kind of uh, score points off that in the same way that someone who might be turned off by liberal Protestantism would actually be more in the camp of a conservative or an evangelical or fundamentalist sure, Protestant sure. than he would be. So there's a reverse psychology here. Yes, yes. So my, my conservative Roman Catholic <laughs> friends like to hear me bash the tasteless uh, modern liturgies of Rome because they, um, they, they, sh they may not share my opinion about the papacy, but they certainly do about right. that. But I'm interrupting again. But what anyway, those, thing? those yes. two things together, the kind of personal considerations of not wanting to jump from chaos to chaos, uh, combined with the historical question about the papacy, which of course the Roman Catholic Church will always force you to consider. It isn't a footnote over here somewhere. They, they build a lot around this and a lot of the later editions of Roman Catholic theology, for instance, the Immaculate Conception of Mary, this idea that she was sinless or uh, the idea of purgatory or limbo or transubstantiation in, this, in the scholastic sense of thinking that an actual molecular change takes place. These are all later editions that were only made possible because of a quote infallible papal pronouncement, which have never been received or accepted by the rest of the Christian church, or to put it the other way, the Eastern church, until the Protestants came along and often rebelled against the same uh, things. So, um, 
you know, for me, I kind of ran into a dead end and I thought, okay, the, the, this, the water runs out in the sand at this point, where will I go? And it was at that point that a good personal friend of mine who is the publisher of a newspaper I edit called The Christian Activist, which is a, a free newsletter journal on these issues, and we can talk about we, that. We will, yes. Um, he called me up and he had been doing some similar reading and, and was on a similar journey, and he said to me, you know, before you completely give up on all of this, you ought to go to an Orthodox church. I have been going to an Orthodox church in Ben Lomond, California. That's where he lived. Come on out here and see it. So I actually got on a plane and went out. And what was meant to be a, a, a couple of days uh, with my friend turned into about two weeks. And during that time, I had what I would call a kind of Jurassic Park experience, if you've seen the movie. <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> well, if you remember, the movie is about a guy studying uh, dead dinosaur bones who then goes to this island, and through the marvels of modern genetic technology, they've resurrected a dinosaur. Right. And he sees a real one lope by. Well, I had been reading all these uh, ancient texts and liturgies of people by St. John Chrysostom and St. Basil the Great and James, uh, the, the first uh, bishop of Jerusalem and so forth. Um, and all of a sudden here they all were actually being done uh, in the manner in which the church has always done them. And I don't make that as a theological statement, but just purely as a historical observation. So it was like, well, what's this? Uh, and California of all places. Yes, yes. You know, maybe this is a new uh, liturgical <laughs> a new ride at, Disney, at <laughs> Disneyland where they're resurrecting it, you know. But uh, that's when I, that, that was probably back in about 1989. And, and that's when I kind of discovered that um, within the Orthodox Church, uh, the very things that I thought were just simply uh, dead and buried history are actually done and, and kept alive and preserved in their fullness. And, and really, uh, having done all this studying and reading for about 10 years, in, in a sense, I became orthodox uh, when I saw the first liturgy because at that point I understood this isn't just a theoretical manner. There really is somebody still doing this. How do you look upon your past and how do you look upon, well, let's put it this way, how do you look upon people like me and many people watching who are members of Protestant churches? Now, you mean you personally uh, or generically? Well, no, not okay. generically, yes. <laughs> we don't want to get <laughs> uh, too personal today. But uh, I'm a minister in the Christian Reformed Church. Right. We um, very much look at our tradition back to the Reformation. Sure. You, of course, are looking much further and there's something attractive about that. Um, but how, how do you now, as an Orthodox Christian, look back upon your own history sure. as, a, as a Presbyterian? Well, let me put it this way. Um, coming from a Protestant background, if, if you're like me, we always used to think of all differences between Christians in terms of salvation histories. You were either in or out. Uh, sometimes this was an idea of who was saved, who had been born again. Sometimes it was as narrow as denominationally. The, the first thing to say is that hopefully my thinking in this area would reflect that of the historical church and the orthodox church and the teaching since the beginning of the Christian era. After all, the orthodox church does go back to the beginning. Uh, when Paul was writing to the Greeks of, of Corinth or when you think of the church in Antioch, uh, this, this, this is the church of which we're talking. Um, it, there's an unbroken continuity. You can actually find the lists of bishops. Uh, going right back to the apostles within all the major sees of the Orthodox Church, which is pretty phenomenal if you think about that historically. Yes, yes. Theology aside, I mean, if we were atheistic Jews, it's still remarkable to find a 2,000-year-old tradition intact. Right. Um, one of the things that tradition teaches is very different from the teaching of the Reformed uh, Calvinist position on, on, on salvation, and that is that in Orthodox history there's no such thing as the Council of Dort, for instance, which lines up, here are the five things you always need to know, uh, principles like tulip, whatever. The Orthodox Church really believes and teaches that salvation is a mystery between the heart of the individual and God. And so when we look at, for instance, the thief on the cross, we're intrigued because we find that there you have someone who neither prayed the sinner's prayer in other words, he wasn't a, quote, believer from a Protestant point of view, right. nor was he baptized, chrismated, or ever took the Eucharist in an Orthodox church, and yet Christ says, today you'll be with me in paradise. That's a good example. Another one would be, for instance, the centurion in whom Christ found the greatest faith in Israel. This man was neither a Christian uh, nor a nor Jew. Jew right. So what are we talking about here? Well, from the traditional Orthodox point of view, you have to understand that Orthodoxy does not have the same kind of dogmatic theology of salvation, where if you're not in the Orthodox Church, you're lost. And if you don't subscribe to the four points of, of Orthodoxy or the five points of Calvinism or the three points of whatever it would be, you're either in danger of hellfire or very close to it. Mm -hmm. Orthodoxy looks at being part of the church as something 
uh, historically verifiable. You're either in the Orthodox Church or you're not, and I think any historian would see the Orthodox Church as a much more ancient manifestation of Christianity than any Protestant uh, group, just on the basis of history. But in no way does that mean that I or any other Orthodox would look at you and say, are you a Christian? Is your heart right with the Lord? Uh, are you seeking God's will for your life? Or, you know, maybe God doesn't hear or answer your prayers because each person's salvation history really is by the light they have been given. And, uh, and we see both in Scripture and in the teaching of the church that the idea of confusing, um, being in good standing within uh, the church or the body of Christ and how Christ will judge you personally on, on the last day is two different things. It's apples and oranges. So the short answer, how would I regard you or any other Protestant? How would I regard myself uh, if I had been run over by a truck before I joined the Orthodox Church, I, I would regard myself as I would today. And that is, I was a Christian, trusting Christ for my salvation by faith, by grace. Uh, today, I'm a Christian, trusting Christ for my salvation by faith and by grace, who also believes that in order to exercise the fullness of the Christian life that is available to people who are Christians, uh, the best way to do that is to be, um, to be in communion with, be part of the most ancient manifestation of the Christian church that most truly keeps its traditions. Um, but but, but uh, this should not be seen in the light of saying, uh, therefore, that everyone else is either not a Christian or somehow, uh, you know, in, in some way excluded. So I, I think the, the viewpoint here is much more to realize that, for instance, in my book, Dancing Alone, in the second half where I talk about what the church is in the area of the sacraments, what I'm talking about there is coming into the fullness of the Christian life. I'm not saying that everyone who has not experienced the Christian sacraments as properly served within the Orthodox Church is therefore, quote, lost. Nor am I saying I would have been if I had never heard this. However, I am saying and some people, of course, will take issue with yes. this, that, um, that no one in their right mind who, is, who, who becomes convinced of the fact that the Orthodox Church is a repository of true Christian practice that predates Protestantism and Roman Catholicism, avoids many of these problems we have in the West, whether it's the papacy in Catholicism or the kind of chaos of make it up as you go along Christianity and Protestantism, if you're convinced that that is so, why would you not want to join yourself to this body? So I think the shoe's on the other foot. It's a positive one. It's not a negative thing of saying everybody's out. You know, having said that, of course, in my book, Dancing Alone, the whole first half of the book talks about the problems of Protestantism, not from the point of view of saying all Protestants are lost, but from the point of view, I hope, uh, of saying there's a better way. And, uh, and this chaos, this confusion, this schism, these 23,000 denominations, this uh, never-ending strife over doctrine is totally unnecessary. And this isn't some utopian pie in the sky of calling all men to brotherhood. It's just looking at history and saying, uh, aside from the great her heresies that the great councils like Nicaea and Chalcedon and so forth rose up to answer, why was it that there was such unanimity uh, for the majority of, ch of church history in these areas, and then all of a sudden, since pro Protestantism, we're totally fragmented. And uh, those are the kind of questions I ask in my book. I'm not pointing the finger and saying, unless you sign on the dotted line in terms of this and this doctrine, you are lost. Well, that's I, I that's like, a different deal. I like the emphasis you make that, um, in a sense, you have found something more, you found the more full, right? something fuller, fuller. <laughs> Than, than perhaps you experienced as a Protestant. Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing. You know, I was appalled the other day. Uh, I have a 14-year-old son right now, and I was appalled, as I'm always appalled, at the American educational system, private, public, uh, this kind of dumbing down, this lowest common denominator. And I said, you know, look, you're in eighth grade. You're going to high school next year. Let's take a look at your textbooks. He said, oh, well, you'll be pleased because next, next week we're going to do a Shakespeare play. And I said, tremendous. At last, they're going to actually do something. Um, well, what's it turn out to be? It's a seven-page synopsis as told by in some awful social studies, gucky, you know, worksheet page. So I said to him, okay, that's it. Um, from now on at home, every night, we are going to do, you know, Winston Churchill's History of the English-Speaking People for an hour, <laughs> and we're going to do a Shakespeare play every couple of months together. And I will sit and read it with you, and I'll show you what this is about. Okay, now, am I saying that the seven-page synopsis was valueless? No, I guess that it's better to read Hamlet in seven pages as retold by some second-rate educator than not at all. But the fullness of Hamlet 
is not this. The fullness is Hamlet. It's the original. It's the real thing. Well performed, properly choreographed, on a good stage with good actors, the way it was intended to be. Now, that's a that's that, a very I would say close parallel, parallel. between Protestantism yeah. and, and Orthodox. Church. Yeah, I would just say when you when you finish going through, say, just take one example. Um, if you go through the Orthodox Holy Week leading up to Pascha, which is Orthodox Easter, um, if you have listened to the readings and you've been through the services of, of that whole week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Holy Thursday, Friday, and you've seen the way the church prepared for the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, as it were, for 2,000 years, and you have listened to the liturgies in those two and three and four hour services, you come to Easter in a totally different frame of mind than if it's all the Easter bunny, some chocolate, an egg roll or an egg hunt, and a, and a, and a, and a 30 minute sunrise service, you know, beamed by a satellite from Jerusalem by some mm -hmm. televangelist. Um, okay, I'm not saying that, that that person has none of the truth in light of Christ, because after all, grace is not limited to the church. In fact, as Christians, we believe grace is not even limited only to Christians because human beings are all created sure. in the image of God even sure. when they deny that God. Right. But if you go through an Orthodox Holy Week, just take that one example, all 24 hours of services over a week, okay? Talk about teaching, by the way. Um, you know, I must say the first time I went through Holy Week and came up to the Orthodox Easter or Pascha, I can honestly say as someone raised by Francis and Edith Schaefer who love their parents and stand by everything they believe in and no sense of rebelled against that tradition, no animosity at all. Nevertheless, I can honestly look you in the face and tell you it's the first time that I had any inkling of what the death and the resurrection of Christ was about. Because it was the difference between Hamlet as retold by Jerry Smith in five pages in words of one syllable and Hamlet, where all of a sudden you're sitting and watching the real drama and, and Sir John Gielgud's playing the ghost and Kenneth, Kevin Branagh is playing Hamlet. And all of a sudden you're saying, this is what it was about. No wonder I couldn't get interested in this garbage in my junior high. This is Hamlet. Why didn't someone tell me this was Hamlet? Now I know why they call this a classic. All right, well, it's like that. When, 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 you, when you first go into an Orthodox liturgy, at first you're just a tourist. You're looking around, what's this, what's that, what's that? And of course, you're not really seeing what's there. But I, I, I would defy anyone from a Protestant background to go to an Orthodox church, say, for two months. That's eight Sundays. And uh, then, for instance, go through one of the great cycles of prayer and teaching and worship, such as the Holy Week leading up to Pascha or Easter, mm -hmm. to come away and say that they did not gain a, a profoundly different and deeper insight of what their faith is about than they had ever thought existed in either the dry sermons and theology of the Reformed tradition or the drum-banging hysterics of our more, uh, you know, Pentecostal sure, brethren. Sure. I'm not saying these things have no value. I'm not saying there aren't good people involved. I'm not saying many of them aren't certainly much more spiritual than I am. But I am saying that the fullness of the Christian tradition is something that I think most Protestants in this country uh, speaking for myself, certainly, have no idea what is available to them. And I think that's the aspect. It has nothing to do with excluding people. It's, uh, on my part, the reason I wrote Dancing Alone and the reason I edit The Christian Activist is, frankly, because um, there's some really good news here for people who are sick of the trivialization. Worship is entertainment. Worship is called dry education, as if somehow the sermon is what worship is, whereas teaching is nothing to do necessarily with worship, right. communion with God. The, um, these aspects are something that I want to share with yes. people, and that's what the book and the paper is about. And I want to explore more with you, too, this relationship between orthodoxy and Catholicism and Protestantism and the ecumenical movement and so forth. We're going to do that in a moment. We're going to take a break right now. We hope you'll be back as we continue talking with Frank Schaefer. Reading your book, Dancing Alone, listening to you here, you... Um, and, and I, I would say, you know, appropriately so, have criticisms of the Protestant church, um, criticisms of the Catholic tradition, which ultimately led you to the Orthodox tradition. What kind of relationship would you like to see between these traditions? Is there something the Orthodox can learn from the Reformed and the Protestants? Certainly, I, you're, you would say, there's much we can learn from the Orthodox. Mm -hmm. um, how do we coexist in a world where we're not all overnight going to simply say, yep, sure. you're right, uh, sure. this is a very anemic kind of religion, we better go back to the Orthodox tradition. That won't well, happen. How do we live, meanwhile, as we... I think that's a great question, and I would put it this way. I think that 
there are two kinds of ecumenism or ecumenical movement. There's the one that we all know and, at least in my case, dislike so heartily, and that is what I'd call the ecumenism of unbelief. We're all adults here. We're all liberals. None of us take our traditions that seriously, so we can all get together and just talk theologically. And it's like these interfaith dialogues. This man's a Jew. Someone's a Muslim. I'm supposedly a Christian, but I'll never mention Christ. The Jew's not going to talk about Palestine. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a kind of a conspiracy of silence about things that ought to be discussed. That's not the way to do it. Right. But I think there is an ecumenism of belief, which has nothing to do with pretending that we can just paper over our differences, but rather says, OK, let's look at this dying, secularized, hedonistic culture around us. We're all living in the new Sodom, whatever we believe, uh, the capital of worldwide hedonism right here in America. North America. North yeah, America. Okay. What do we do about that? Um, what do we do about the abortion clinic on the corner? What do we do about the fact that in our schools we're teaching 80-year-olds how to use condoms before we're teaching them how to read? What do we do about the fact of, of what uh, Richard John Newhouse talks about in his brilliant book published by Erdman's called The Naked Public Square, this syndrome where religious, uh, religious ideas and presuppositions are being thrown out of the, the, the public forum and not even allowed into the forum where anybody who brings up one of these issues is labeled new religious right as a pejorative, say. How do we present a united front to our local school board when it comes to the fact that, yes, indeed, we believe, even for historical reasons, we should have some religious instruction in our schools, that you shouldn't have American history neutered of all religious involvement, that kids have got to know whether we like them or not, that the Puritans who came over came for religiously idealistic reasons, uh, uh, that this is, this is history. Um, so I think there is so much in what I would call our dying and sick American culture, because that's what it is. Um, that we, as, as people of the book, to use the Muslim phrase, can agree on um, whether, it is, whether it is the sanctity of human life, the worthwhileness of education, because after all, we all share the belief that man is created with a greater purpose than the gross national product, and that the reason for education is not just simply to train good workers. The reason is because we have souls and minds that are a gift from God, and these should be used and not thrown away. Uh, one of the great reform uh, principles that came out of Calvinism, one of the positive aspects of it, this is something that we can talk about and agree on. So I would just say the kind of ecumenism that I think is useless is what I would call, quote, theological dialogue between people who are more interested in the social aspects of all getting together than they are in really talking about truth. Um, I'd much rather sit down with a conservative or orthodox Jewish rabbi who says, you're absolutely wrong about Jesus Christ. Uh, he is not the son of God. However, what can we do about uh, what can we do about relativistic sex education in our schools? Then I would some smarmy uh, Jewish rabbi of the Reformed tradition say, who doesn't even believe in his own Judaism, doesn't really expect me to believe in my Christ. And so we can kind of agree on a social agenda of wishy-washy platitudes mm -hmm. of human of love and the brotherhood of mankind. So I'd say the way people of the book people of faith get on is by clearly stating their differences and then saying, nevertheless, we are citizens of this culture together. All of our tra tra traditions teach us that we should render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God that which is God's and what is Caesar's and what is God's. Let's discuss that. And then in, 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 in that formulation, let's present a united front on some of these issues. So I don't see taking a strong position religiously, say me being Orthodox or you being Protestant, as a barrier to both of us being on the local fire department. And if we get called, we put the fire out, whatever that fire might be. But meanwhile, I get the impression, though, that you are encouraged, you would encourage me to look seriously at the Orthodox tradition. I and, certainly would. And to experience the fullness of Christianity by perhaps moving closer to it. Look, I, I would on two fronts. Uh, on, a, on a national front, when you look at the direction that pluralistic American Protestant culture is headed, if this isn't cause for a second look, I don't know what is. I mean, after all, in 1989, the latest year that statistics are available, as I say in my book, Dancing Alone, I cite it in a footnote, the United Nations um, Census on Worldwide Religions says there are now 23,000 Protestant denominations with an average of five new ones being added a week. Now, let's just talk Turkey here. You think this is what John Calvin had in mind? I don't think so. No, I don't either, <laughs> because I don't think he was a lunatic. Right, right. I mean, obviously, this is not what the reformers had in mind either. So let the debate begin. Uh, is this just a perversion of the reformed heritage, or did something go off the rails? Or is there something about the Western tradition? Notice I didn't say Protestant. 
that Augustinian scholastic rationalism that you have in the West, that you see particularly in St. Thomas Aquinas, that scholastic tradition, the apotheosis of which is the Council of Dort and, the, uh, and their five resolutions, which is the most scholastic statement of faith and God that you can find. The Orthodox would say it is heretical because it puts God in a scholastic box as if somehow we have described God's character. Whereas the, the teaching of the, the, the church has always been, I mean the Orthodox church, uh, you can't put God in a box and not only is salvation a, a mystery, but um, what we don't know about God is the only thing we can really say in the sense that uh, we are human and God is God and when it comes to these questions of predestination and free will and when it comes to this sort of Augustinian take on Paul's statements uh, that we would feel would have been taken grossly out of context on on the whole idea of predestination or the election to salvation on one hand and damnation on the other. The problem with all this from the orthodox position is that it's over-rationalistic. It puts too much faith in, in the human mind and not enough in God and not enough in the mystery of spirituality. And we would say it isn't that we have an alternative dogma. You know, the reformed theologian always would expect, okay, well, what are your five points right, then? Right. It would be there are no five points. Um, salvation and holiness and grace are mysteries. Um, you know, the idea would be God is bigger than we are and uh, the words we use about God, even the words in the Bible used to describe him after all are just human words to describe something outside of time and space. Who are we to lay out this rationalistic little grid of beliefs and dogma? It's, so, so I think a lot of Protestants would think that somehow orthodoxy is closer to Roman Catholicism because of the outward rubrics of sure. vestments or something. Sure. It's actually not true. Um, dogmatic Reformed Calvinism is closer to dogmatic Roman Catholicism than either of them are to Orthodoxy. And that's something I think anyone who reads my book, Dancing Alone, will come to realize, that whatever else they take from the book, they are going to at least understand that when you lump Orthodox and Catholics together as if some Protestants are different, that really the Western tradition is more similar than it is different. It's different in superficial things like what priests wear, or the order of service, but it's the same in that it, all the Protestant traditions, from charismatic to reformed, tend, especially on the reformed side, tend to put what we would feel from an orthodox position is way too much faith in human reason. And we would say that it is the same departure from the biblical viewpoint that the complete secularists of the Enlightenment took when they said, okay, the way I put it in my book is I say this, the reformers said sola scriptura. Right. The enlightenment thinkers of the humanists just took it one step further. They said, what do you mean sola scriptura? How about just sola, me alone? Why the scriptura? Whereas the church is always saying it's not me alone anything. It's the community of belief experiencing the love of God, which is a holy mystery beyond human contemplation. So the funny thing is from a Protestant point of view, when you look at something like the Council of Dort, the Protestants always saying, well, what's your alternative? The Orthodox is saying the problem isn't they got the wrong five points. The problem is you can't make five, five points, points that, about grace I and God you. and I salvation. Sure. And, uh, and, and what you do is have to accept some of these things truly on the basis of faith and mystery and love and these kinds of things. It's a very different take. You know, it's right off the map. So the funny thing is if you got Thomas Aquinas and John Calvin in a room, they'd understand each other perfectly. You put the Orthodox into the mix, he'd be the odd man out. Because Aquinas and Calvin would be speaking each other's language, which is the Western idea of rationalism. It's the mathematical approach to reality. The Eastern Orthodox person would keep saying, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, but isn't God bigger than this? What about spirituality? What about experience? What about worshiping with your whole body, wherein when you make your sign of the cross or you make a prostration uh, before the altar, that's worship too. You could be an illiterate mute, mm -hmm. and that's as worshipful as a theological pronouncement because God sees the heart. And so, see, he's kind of right out of the theological right. debate. And I, and I hope some of that comes through in the book sure. Dancing Alone. And I think it does. Frank Schaefer, thank you for being with us on thank Calvin uh, Forum. Thank you for watching.